Hi, this is Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. My guest today is Amy Lang. Amy is a sex educator and founder of birdsandbeesandkids.com. Amy teaches parents of all beliefs how to have easy, open, and effective conversations with their kids about sexuality, love, and relationships. Hi, Amy. Welcome to Family Confidential. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you today. Well, I'm always excited to talk about empowering kids and helping parents um, get over some of the uh, difficult conversations that come up. We either talking about internet safety or um, in this case, we're talking about sex and kids. And your business, Birds and Bees and Kids, is, as I read on your website, um, hopefully to get parents really excited about having the talk. So tell me, how'd you get into this business? Well, I was a sex educator throughout my 20s and 30s, and when it came time for me to talk to my own sweet boy, I froze. Uh, He wasn't even asking me a sex question. He was just making a comment about his penis, and I kind of freaked out, and I had been talking to people for years about sexuality. So interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was completely surprised at how uncomfortable I was. And it was that moment where I thought, okay, I've got a master's degree in adult education. I love talking about sex. So I think I will just combine these two loves and figure out how to help other parents and myself really talk to their kids about sexuality. So I did that 10 years ago. So I've been at this for a while and it's never dull. Well, here's the thing. Um, I'm I'm really appreciative about your honesty. They say you froze. And here you had been doing this professionally for a while before your own son, you know, um, was four. And, and you felt like, okay, this is a good time to start this conversation. Where do you think that paralysis that parents feel comes from? Well, I think it comes from a couple of different sources. But I think the biggest one has to do with our own discomfort with sexuality in general. And for parents who are parenting in the United States, we're super puritanical and closed about sexuality. Most of us didn't have good examples in our own families about, you know, as to how to talk to kids effectively. And then we also live in this culture that is over-sexualized. So we have this, these two crazy things happening at the same time. One, We're anxious about talking to our kids because we're afraid we're going to ruin them somehow. And then on the other hand, we are inundating our children with sexualized information, uh, whether we intend to or not. And so I think what happens for most parents is they think, okay, I have to talk about this. Uh Uh-oh, it's really grown-up stuff. Uh Uh-oh, if I tell my kid about this, then are they going to do it? Oh, no, it's going to ruin their innocence. And so we have all these kind of internal conversations that really just serve to keep us stalled out from having decent, fun, interesting, effective conversations. Yeah, with I mean, when I heard your list of oh, no's, I'm starting to get tense and I don't even have to talk to anybody about this. But yeah. I understand what you mean. Um, so clearly your approach is to help parents feel more relaxed mm-hmm. about these conversations and how... In a nutshell, how do you do it? Well, the easiest way to get more relaxed about it is to start way sooner than later. And I think most parents think, oh no, my kid's 10, 11, probably should talk to them about sex and puberty. And the reality is that by the time they're 10 or 11, they've heard a lot about sex and sometimes even puberty. And so if we wait that long, we're actually doing ourselves and our kids a disservice. So the easiest thing to do is start is to start as soon as possible. And that means using the correct names with your tiny baby baby for their, you know, for their private body parts. Um, most people have not had the opportunity to start the conversation with their kids. So they're jumping in a little later in the game. And I think the best thing they can do for themselves and really for their kids is to admit that they were waited too long and that they probably should have started about talking about this sooner and jump in. Um, I think we kind of think that we have to have these like lectures and be super well informed and be like mini sex educators as parents. And we really don't. We really need to think about this in terms of like how we talk about manners. Like you know, nobody's ever waits around for their kid to ask them about manners. We just teach manners. Right. And so adding this to our list of things that we educate our kids about in that same kind of small bite, small dose way makes it a lot easier rather than taking on a, like a four hour lecture. Yeah, for sure. With the, with the PowerPoint and everything. Right. Um, exactly. <laughs> well, here's, here's what I'm thinking. The thing about manners is, um, and, and 
Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate for mm. just just a moment because that's kind of my role here. Is is that when we can model good manners, but when we're talking about behavior, for example, um, respectful behavior in a sexual relationship, or even talking about um, mm, sexism, um, jokes that are not necessarily funny to everybody involved, these kinds of things. We don't often as parents model that. And so it's maybe a little more difficult in the natural scheme of things to to model these conversations. And maybe that's a cop out, but go ahead. So, you know, I think we can use just about anything as a cop out. Uh, I think we're, we work really hard. I think lots of parents work really hard to avoid having these conversations, <laughs> frankly. So I would say that, yes, we model uh, manners, but yes, we also model rep, uh, conversations about sexuality. When we're not talking about it, we're modeling. Okay. When we're uh, letting a, a sexist joke go by, we're modeling. When we're in crappy relationships and we treat our partners ah. um, not respectfully, we're modeling. When we don't use correct names for private body parts, we're modeling. And good. so there's tons of nuts and boltsy stuff like, you know, what goes where and how babies are made and different kinds of sex and that sort of thing. That's just facts. That's just information that kids need to have. And when it comes to the rest of the story, which is really about the social, the psychological implications of being in relationship and dating and all of that, mm -hmm. that's stuff we really can model. And frankly, like I said before, our culture is over-sexualized, so there's lots and lots of opportunity to say, hey, you know, when that kid, when that guy treated that girl that way and then she went out on a date with him anyway, you know, I don't think that's cool and here's why. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I get that I get that this is hard. I mean, my child is 14. He is mortified by my work and he has told me point blank that he would rather talk to strangers than talk to me or his dad. <laughs> so, um, you know, I feel your pain and then I also don't, you know, people don't have it. I mean, I think I have it worse than just about everybody else. I mean, I'm the sex educator, right? Right. What is this? My guinea pig won't let me practice. <laughs> well, so I practice anyway, right? Well, I bet even though he's pushing you away with one with one arm, he's probably extraordinarily grateful to have had you as a mom. Well, and see. I'm guessing also he may be giving some really good information to his friends. Yes. Yeah. If, yeah, I think so. And his friends also know that I know what's going on. And so they will confide in me in, in small ways. And so they know that they can get the information they need um, from me if their parents aren't stepping up. And all their parents know that I talk openly with their kids. So everybody seems to be cool with it so far. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the bottom line is that when we let our own discomfort get in the way of educating our children about this really important and fundamental part of life, we're doing them a huge disservice because we're uncomfortable, which is crazy because yeah. life is uncomfortable. And if you are protecting your kids from being uncomfortable, you're protecting them from a world of um, trouble, let's say. Yeah, I, I'm totally there with you, Amy. And I really appreciate this getting past the discomfort to do what you need to do as a parent. I yeah. mean, yeah. So you know, this is so interesting because here we could be talking about penises and vagina with our, with our um, three-year-old in the bathtub. Um, and that's very different. And then you could talk about the facts of where babies come from. Mm -hmm. And, and then we get into like tween and teen years. And now we're talking about your own behavior, son or daughter yes. in a sexual relationship. Um, that has to do with values, personal values as in, in terms of a family and what a parent thinks is an appropriate time for kids to become sexually active mm -hmm. and where that may fall in, in terms of where a kid feels he or she is ready for that. I mean, these are, these are very big questions. Some of them are very personal questions. Yeah. And, you know, I'm of the mind that we give kids information and that empowers them to make better decisions. Same. Yep. So my question to you is, um, for parents, um, it behooves us, of course, always to transmit our values, but our values may not be the same values as our kids in, in a lot of this. Right. 
And, you know, I just like your values aren't the same as your parents and my values aren't exactly the same as my parents. You know, our kids' values are going to be different than ours. But our job as parents is to set our kids up. And, of course, we all want our kids to share our values, right? So when we're talking to children about, like, when's a good time to have sex, it's great and important to say, hey, I think you should wait to have sex until you're, you know, in a loving, committed relationship until you understand, you know, all the ways to protect yourself, that you and your partner are both committed and everybody's consenting. And then that's a go. And ideally, you know, in my personal purview, that's, you know, senior, junior, senior year of high school, college, later. And then the longer a kid can wait, the better it is if they're waiting for that first time to be really really good. Like they look back and they think, yes, I totally nailed that. Pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> they feel, look back and feel really good. And by, you know, lots of families will say, well, we expect you to wait until marriage. And that's a great goal. But the reality is 95% of Americans have sex before they get married. And you can say that, but marriage has never been compelling ever to a horny in love teenager. So it's better to talk about why marriage is the goal. What is it about marriage? Is that that loving, committed relationship piece? Is it, um, you know, is it about the, oops, sorry. Is it about the uh, longevity of the, um, you know, the relationship? Is it because the theory is that you will be married forever and the reality is that they won't? I mean, what is it about marriage that makes that the goal? And so when you're talking about this, waiting for sex idea in a really real way and a relatable way, then kids are going to take that information in and they're going to do what they will with it, right? They're going to make their own decisions. And I think one of the biggest traps for parents is that they have this idea that if we talk to our kids openly about sex, they're going to have sex. And guess what? It's not what the, what the data shows. No. And they're going to have sex anyway. Well, they're going to have sex anyway, but uh, I have read data that, that seems to indicate that kids who can talk openly with their parents about sex and, and commitment and respect within sexual relationships wait longer mm -hmm. to have sex. Yep. And when they have sex, they are more likely to use protection. And that's what we want, right? I mean, <laughs> yes. if my kid's going to have sex, I'd rather he have sex at 14 and he is loving, committed relationship, they have protection, everyone's consenting, than to have sex at 19 to get it over with, and it's a random situation at a party, and nobody's protected, and maybe there's alcohol involved, and so consent, consent's not 100% clear. So I'd take younger and all those things lined up as opposed to later and get it out of the way. So you know, I, I think that one of the things that was really helpful to me, actually, when I started my business, and I did all this research... And I was looking at, you know, what's what works for kids in terms of helping them wait as long as possible and also in terms of helping them to have sex safely. And I remember I'm like, okay, I've got this figured out. And then I had this moment of doubt because I was having people say to me, friends, like, why are you doing this? This is crazy. Like, no one's going to hire you. And, you know, this is weird. And I remember that I had this revelation, which was that my job as my kid's mom is to keep him healthy and safe. That's it. That's my primary job. And talking about sexuality is all about health and safety. And so if I am falling down on my job by not talking to him about sex because I'm uncomfortable, then I'm not setting him up to be a whole, healthy, happy adult. Because right. that's our job, right? We're yeah. raising adults. We're not raising kids. Exactly. Totally. And, and you know, I'm, I'm especially pleased that you happen to have a son because, <laughs> because too often sex education um, is turned to girls and what they should be prohibiting about mm -hmm. touching their bodies and, and letting other people come close to them. And, and when something goes wrong, like an, un, an unplanned pregnancy of a teenager or transmission of a sexually transmitted disease because of unprotected sex, um, it's somehow the girl's fault. Right. And we all know it takes two to tango. And when boys are equally educated in these realms, um, they're going to make better choices as well as the girls. Absolutely. And everybody needs to pack condoms. That is not the job of the boy. It's the job of everybody to have condoms. And we need to really think about, you know, like everybody needs to know all about the different kinds of birth control. Because if your girlfriend is like, we'll just use condoms and her boyfriend is able to say, you know what, actually, I think you should be long on long acting reversible contraception. Let's go get you a Marina IUD. You won't have a period and you won't be able to get pregnant for five to seven years. I think that sounds like a total win. <laughs> 
that seems like a total win to me. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, we want everybody well educated so that everybody has the same opportunity to make really great decisions. And to have the kind of life that they envision for themselves. Yes. Which often does not include being a parent as a teenager. Yes. For most of us, that is not the plan. Yeah. We're totally on the same page. So tell me, um, when people do call you up, um, what, what do you provide for them? So what I provide for most parents is, uh, just an opportunity to figure out their own values about sexuality and to put in place a plan for how they want to start the conversations, what they feel like those conversations should look like. I basically take away the kind of some of the guesswork because I can offer them, um, you know, what they need to know by when, what kids need to know by when. I can help them with a, like my super simple sex talking formula, which makes all the conversations short and sweet. And I basically uh, strip away some of that um, defensiveness and some of that, like, I can't do this feeling and encourage and empower them. I mean, really, I give them information so they're empowered, so they feel more comfortable and confident talking to their kids. And then They talk to their kids and then guess what? Their kids are more empowered and their kids are more comfortable and confident. So it's like this lovely real life trickle down. No, it's great. Totally great. We have about one minute left. And before we go, I'd love to give you an opportunity to let our listeners and viewers know where they can find out more about your work. Oh, absolutely. So my website is birdsandbeesandkids.com. And on my site, I have lots of video and pre-recorded webinars. So you can watch and learn from me at any time that you want to. I'm also pretty active on Facebook. It's Birds, Bees, Kids. And one of the most fun things I do there is about once a week, I post help another parent. So a parent will contact me and ask, you know, like, oh, how how do I handle this situation? What do you think? And then my fans are brilliant. And so they will oftentimes give better advice than me. Uh, and then I'm also active on Twitter. It's Birds and Bees. And I post more um, articles and sort of things like that there. Uh, I, re- I repost a bunch of stuff too because I think that's one of Twitter's one of the best places to find kind of emerging and new information especially about sexuality and parenting and what else and I also do keynote talks and one other piece of my business is that I work with professionals who work with children to help them understand how to manage our over sexualized culture how to handle sexualized behavior in children what's typical what's not and how to um, discern what's uh, what they can expect from kids in terms of their behaviors so that they feel more confident and empowered and the kids that are in their care are safer from sexual abuse and then they are too that they're protected that's great really really wonderful work I'm so glad that we connected Amy yeah I really appreciate the time you've taken today to talk to us. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential. To learn more about my work, visit AnnieFox.com. And check out my parenting book, Teaching Kids to Be Good People. And my book for tween girls, the girls' Q&A book on friendship, 50 Ways to Fix a Friendship Without the Drama. And if you like this podcast, we ask that you review it on iTunes. It may be a little thing to you, but it means an awful lot to us. Family Confidential Podcast is produced by Electric Eggplant, creators of books and apps for parents, kids, tweens, and teens. And please tune in next time when my guest will be Maggie Baird. Maggie is a singer-songwriter and the screenwriter on the new film Life Inside Out, which she co-stars with her son, musician and actor Phineas O'Connell. Until next time... Happy parenting.